Thank you. Uh, can we have the lights down, please? So in the next about 35, 40 minutes, we look at various airway diseases. And I'll be talking about large airway disease, uh, where typically we will spend some time on bronchiectasis, and then move on to small airways disease, where we will talk about proliferative bronchiolitis and obliterative or constrictive bronchiolitis. When we talk about bronchiectasis, there are specific clinical questions that need to be answered. The first is whether there is bronchiectasis or not, and how do we make that diagnosis. Uh, the second would be the ability to find an etiology, if at all, uh, to stage the bronchiectasis, especially if surgery is going to be an option, and to see the extent of small airways disease or constrictive bronchiolitis along with the bronchiectasis that then affects the functional outcome <clears throat> of the pathology. So how do we diagnose bronchiectasis? When we look at an HRCT image, we see the black bronchus and the white artery going together. That's the normal anatomy. Either we see them in cross-section as a kind of an invert, uh, in, inverted spectacle, you have the white bronchus and the black artery, or you can see them as tubular structures uh, when, we, when we cut them uh, face. Uh, we never see bronchioles that are less than two millimeters in diameter, and we also do not see bronchioles in the last uh, two centimeters of the lungs. And therefore, if the bronchus is larger than the accompanying artery, then it implies that there is bronchiectasis. If there is a perceptible wall thickening, so while we don't actually measure the wall, Normally, as you see here, there is an imperceptible or a minimally thin wall that the normal bronchus has. If we find a wall that is perceptibly thick, then that goes hand in hand with the bronchiectasis. The lack of tapering, normally the daughter bronchus should be smaller uh, than the parent bronchus. If the daughter bronchus is of the same size as the parent bronchus, then it means that there is bronchiolectasis or bronchiectasis. And when we see uh, dilated bronchi or bronchioles in the last two centimeters of the lungs, that again implies that there is bronchiectasis. So these are the signs that tell us that we're actually dealing with bronchiectasis and there is an underlying abnormality. In the olden days when we were doing bronchography, we actually used to classify bronchiectasis into tubular, saccular, cystic, etc. This doesn't really have much clinical significance, though cystic bronchiectasis, as we see here with a bunch of grapes appearance, uh, does lend itself to an increased incidence of superadded infection and functional disturbance. And therefore, uh, having purely cystic bronchiectasis perhaps is not such a good thing. The other time when we can get into a little trouble with making the diagnosis is when there is mucoid impaction within all the dilated bronchi. Uh, the way to make sure that we don't um, uh, uh, you know, have a problem here is to identify the fact that when we have two white structures next to each other, uh, <clears throat> that is abnormal. We have to have a black and a white structure together. We can't have two white structures, and therefore it stands to reason that one of the white structures is an impacted dilated bronchus. And so when we see two white structures going hand in hand or running together from the hilum to the periphery, that should raise our antennae and, and make us think about bronchiectasis with uniform mucoid impaction within all the bronchi. So making a diagnosis of bronchiectasis is perhaps one of the simplest things um, that we can do on CT scan, which is also one of the reasons that um, almost as soon as CT scan started being used for the lungs, uh, bronchography became pretty much dead immediately. It didn't require, in fact, we didn't even have the clinical validation with the research um, um, you know, that kind of uh, was required to say that bronchography is not, not uh, going to be done in patients. It was so obvious and straightforward that, you know, one day you were doing bronchograms and the second day you pretty much stopped doing them. Um, 
The next thing we would do once we've picked up the bronchiectasis is to identify the etiology. The commonest cause of bronchiectasis in the developing world or in a country like India is post-infectious. It's usually following viral infection in childhood and there is destruction of the bronchial walls and that then leads to bronchiectasis. The second commonest cause in India would be tuberculosis and then when we move on to the developing world where these infections are not so common, then we look at cystic fibrosis, Carter Jenner's or the immotile cilia syndrome. Uh, we have other forms of infections and then we have allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis or ABPA and rheumatoid arthritis and other connective tissue diseases. Uh, this is a patient I saw when I was a resident way back in 1988. Um, and I have kept these slides to remind me that even in those days we could make the diagnosis. So here's a patient with dextrocardia. You have bronchiectasis in the left middle lobe and you see that really well on the CT scan and the patient had atrophic sinusitis. So this combination of findings is what we get with the immotile cilia syndrome or the so-called Cartagena's syndrome. The other entity that can be reasonably well diagnosed is this one, where we have proximal central bronchiectasis. You can see that at the periphery we do not see bronchiectasis, and this is very well appreciated on the axial images as well. So this pattern of bronchiectasis is typically seen with allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis or ABPA. But as radiologists, we must keep in mind that ABPA is a clinical diagnosis. These are patients who present with asthma and then they are reactive um, or they react to the um, antigen or the aspergillus antigen and they have the antibodies. But if the patient doesn't have asthma, the patient doesn't have a clinical possibility of ABPA, then the structural um, uh, uh, abnormality does not necessarily lend itself to that diagnosis. So when we read these scans and we don't have the history, we would say that the possibility of ABPA should be considered if clinically relevant and therefore you then uh, have to put these things together. The one pathognomonic finding though it's, is not the distribution, it's the presence of hyperdense mucoid impaction. The hyperdense mucoid impaction is similar to the hyperdense stuff that we get with sinonasal polyposis and this is a combination of uh, impacted aspergillus hyphae and high density mucoid impaction. So where are uh, high density mucus and protein. So when we see high density mucoid impaction within the dilated bronchi, that uh, should pretty much uh, raise our antennae for allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. ABPA can, um, uh, need not be very uh, severe and can be controlled. But there are situations and there are patients where come what may, do whatever you want, it's extremely difficult to control the process. This is a patient and I'll, and I'll show you a series of scans that we have from 2002 till date. When she first presented in 2002, she had this mucoid impaction that we see here with some consolidation. In 2003, you already see the extent of bronchiectasis and some residual consolidation that she had. In 2007, she has mucoid impaction and bronchial obstruction in some of the other segments here. The bronchiectasis is worsened. 2008, another segment shows mucoid impaction. Um, both on the right as well as in the left, um, both in the upper lobe as well as in the middle lobe. By 2012, most of her tracheobronchial tree is fired and you've got extensive bronchiectasis all through and you see one more area of new mucoid impaction in the left lower lobe. Um, so this is, this is how bad it can get. So while the vast majority of ABPAs can be well controlled, you can have the occasional patient who you're just not able uh, to take care of. And then there are other causes of uh, bronchiectasis that perhaps may not be so common. Here is a patient, 32 years old, who's got extensive bronchiectasis but also has tracheobronchomegaly. And then you see these very characteristic tracheal diverticulae 
and the bronchial diverticuli, and this is a congenital condition called Munier Kuhn syndrome. When we're looking at children, um, and Erica spoke about this condition where we have bronchiectasis in children, again, this could be post infectious. When we're scrolling down, and this is where it helps to have the lung windows and the soft tissue windows together, and occasionally you find a patient who's got pancreatic atrophy and fat infiltration, even if you don't have the history, you can put these two things together and make a diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. So we've made a diagnosis of bronchiectasis. In some instances, we have specific etiologies that we pick up, and then we need to stage. Staging is important only from the perspective of deciding whether this patient is a candidate for lobectomy or pneumonectomy. And here is a patient who on the radiograph has left mid and lower zone bronchiectasis. Perhaps if this is restricted to the lower lobe, then a lower lobe lobectomy would be of help. But we find here that there is lingular bronchiectasis, there's lower lobe bronchiectasis, there's right middle lobe bronchiectasis, and surgery then does not become an option in this patient. Another patient who has left lung disease, and when we scan from the apex to the base, we found that there was lingular and lower lobe bronchiectasis, uh, but there was nothing on the right side. So if clinically we were to believe that lobectomy or pneumonectomy would help in this patient, then a pneumonectomy would have to be done in this patient, and the right lung is good enough to take care of the patient um, for time to come. The important thing, of course, is not just the bronchiectasis. It's the extent of the small airways disease that actually results in a functional problem that is usually far out of proportion to just the bronchiectasis that we see. What is constrictive bronchiolitis? This is a situation where there is destruction of the walls of the smaller bronchioles, and this results in air going in but there is air trapping and the air doesn't go out. Eventually, over a period of time, there's a hypoxic vasoconstriction of the vessels that are supplying these segments or subsegments, and eventually there is no gas exchange, so these become dead areas. Now, all of us living in the urban population, when we do our own CT scans, we will find that there are at least a few subsegments that have obliterative bronchiolitis, and we are not symptomatic to the to most extent. Um, and this is something that we see um, as part and parcel of being urban dwellers. But it is when we have large segments of the lung and the bronchial tree that are involved that patients become symptomatic. And the same etiologies that produce bronchiectasis, especially acquired, would also produce constrictive bronchiolitis and then complicate the situation. So post-infectious, Typically, post-viral would be the most common, followed by toxic fume inhalation, connective tissue diseases, drugs, and then following lung or bone marrow transplantation. These patients have a mosaic pattern. They have areas of increased lucency. Within these areas of increased lucency, there's attenuation of the vessels or paucity of vessels. Um, you may or may not get bronchiectasis within these involved segments, and sometimes there may be a tree in bud appearance distally. But the clincher is not just the increased lucency and the paucity of vessels, it's actually the air trapping that we see on the expiratory images. So on the inspiratory image here, we have patchy areas of increased lucency and paucity of vessels, and then significant air trapping. How do we know this is an expiratory image? Here we find that when we go from non-dependent to dependent, there is increasing whitening or increasing um, uh, density that tells us that this is an expiratory image as against the inspiratory image here. But then these are the segments that show air trapping. They continue to remain black. And these are the areas that are due to constrictive bronchiolitis or obliterative bronchiolitis. So when large areas are involved, as we see here, these patients will have small airways disease on pulmonary function testing. They'll have wheezing. They'll have uh, bad auscultative findings, etc., and will be symptomatic. The radiographs are often normal. 
but you can find either a segment or a whole lobe or a whole lung involved in this patient. The left lower lobe shows increased lucency on the inspiratory image and air trapping on the expiratory image. When we have an entire lobe or a lung involved, we often use the term McLeod's or Swire James syndrome, uh, but this is still an acquired condition. This patient has a small left hemithorax. That's because the entire left lung is involved. So both the upper lobe lingula and the lower lobe show increased lucency with paucity of vessels. And on the expiratory image, the normal right lung actually swings into um, uh, uh, the thorax and onto the left side uh, to take care of the rest of the volume uh, that needs to be uh, occupied. And this again is McLeod's or Swire James syndrome. Now these were the conditions where we had the constrictive bronchiolitis without the bronchiectasis, but you can have bronchiectasis occurring within these segments as well. So here we see the upper and the lower lobes showing bronchiectasis, and you can see this in the coronal images where you have the middle and the lower lobes um, uh, involvement seen extremely well um, on, on this plane. Similarly, another patient here who has severe left lung disease with increased lucency. You can see the marked attenuation or paucity of vessels, and there would be air trapping on the expiratory images. Again, the coronal images give a good sense of the extent of disease and the associated bronchiectasis. So that's constrictive bronchiolitis. It's a condition that um, uh, we as radiologists often tend to ignore. Um, but is an extremely important accompaniment to interstitial lung diseases as well as to bronchiectasis. And it is something that we should learn how to recognize in every patient who presents to us with signs and symptoms of diffuse lung disease. And this is what we get, areas of increased lucency, paucity of vessels, and air trapping on expiratory images. May or may not be associated with bronchiectasis, and the involvement may be segmental, low bar or that of the entire lung. So what we've done till now is we've just looked at all the black stuff, right? We've looked at bronchiectasis, which is all which is cystic or tubular, but it's all black dilatation. We've looked at constrictive bronchiolitis, which is increased lucency with air trapping. But we also have, and this is the normal yin-yang balance in life. If you have black, you have white. So you have white conditions that also affect the bronchioles, and we use the term proliferative bronchiolitis because these are inflammatory or infective conditions that actually produce muck within the bronchi or the bronchioles, then that manifests clinically. The commonest condition that we see in practice that does this focally is tuberculosis, and then we have conditions that produce diffuse proliferative bronchiolitis, and these would include a condition called diffuse panbronchiolitis, which is an inflammatory condition, follicular bronchiolitis that typically occurs in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, respiratory bronchiolitis that occurs really only in smokers, and mycobacterium avium intracellular uh, infection that typically occurs in the elderly with vitamin C deficiency and poor dentition. I showed this slide earlier. This is branching, or this is a pattern called infectious bronchiolitis, where we see branching centrilobular opacities and nodules with a branching pattern that was labeled by the first people who wrote this up. Unfortunately, they were from South Korea. They wrote it in Korean, and then it was translated by the AJR editors into English, and somebody translated this into tree and bud. And tree and bud is pretty much uh, not, not a phrase that makes any sense, but nevertheless, it implies that there are buds all around, and that's what we see here. And when the density is high, as you see here as well, this is typically seen with tuberculosis. Now, you may see this with bacterial bronchopneumonias. You may sometimes see this with histoplasmosis as well. But if you had 100 patients with this pattern of tree and bud and branching centrilobular high-density opacities, about 95 of them would be due to some form of tuberculosis. Contrast that appearance to this one. We're here seeing again 
branching centrilobular opacities and nodules, but this is bilateral, reasonably symmetric, distal, and the density of TB is much higher than what we see here. So when we see low density, uh, bilateral distal branching centrilobular opacities and nodules, this is what we get with diffuse inflammatory non-infectious bronchiolitis. And I'd like you to contrast this to the ill-defined centrilobular opacities that we get with hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Those are ill-defined but non-branching centrilobular opacities or the miliary TB nodules that are two to three millimeter sized discrete randomly distributed. These are ill-defined centrilobular tree and bud low density peripheral bilateral symmetric or asymmetric. And when we see this pattern and these patients typically present with bronchi, um, sometimes it's labored breathing um, um, and the, the pulmonologists and physicians will tell us that we're dealing with some form of an airway disease, then these are the conditions that we look at. DPB, which occurs in Koreans and sometimes in the Japanese population, and it's only if you have patients who've been there or are of that nationality that we actually make this diagnosis. Follicular bronchiolitis occurs in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, respiratory bronchiolitis occurs in smokers, and MAI infection occurs in pretty much non-HIV but nutritionally immunocompromised individuals who are typically elderly with some deficiencies. So the pattern, again, is very nonspecific. It's like the ground glass pattern that we see with hypersensitivity pneumonitis that could be many things depending upon the clinical story. Similarly, this pattern of inflammatory bronchiolitis can only be differentiated based upon the presentation. So again, here I could just throw this to you and say, tell me what this is, but you have to then throw it back at me asking me what the history is. And I would tell you this patient is a smoker, in which case you'd say this is respiratory bronchiolitis. So that's pretty much how it works. And you can see these branching, ill-defined centrilobular opacities that are low density and uh, uh, bilaterally symmetrical. So that's essentially proliferative or the white bronchiolitis. Focal high density is TB. Low density diffuse would be DPB, follicular bronchiolitis, respiratory bronchiolitis, or MAI. Spend the next about five minutes looking at large airway visualization in specific instances. And this has essentially, again, become very, very easy to do uh, because on our workstations, when we have these volume stacks with us, we can then use, instead of the maximum intensity projection, which we use for angiograms, etc., we also have something called minimum intensity projection, where the computer takes uh, those structures that are the blackest, and then we're able to sum these up into getting some exquisite images of the trachea and the bronchi. And this helps us in multiple situations. For example, once in a while, when a patient has a bronchopleural fistula and a persistent pneumothorax or a hydropneumothorax, and the surgeon wants us to find the site of the fistula, when we look at something like this here, we're still not very sure whether this is the offending bronchus that is communicating with the pleura. But when we do these minimum IP projections, we can see the bronchial tree so much better here that it allows us with a reasonable amount of confidence to actually see that bronchus growing through the white stuff here and then communicating with the bronchus. Here is another patient who has dyspnea. It looks like one of those uh, whole lung congenital lobar emphysemas that Erica just showed. And you can see here that this patient has complete um, subtotal narrowing of the left uh, upper lobe bronchus uh, which you can so beautifully see on the minimum IP images. The trachea is black, the bronchi are black, and it's a no-brainer to be able to pick up this narrowing. We don't know what the cause was, but this was obviously responsible for the post-obstructive overinflation of the left upper lobe in this patient. And obviously it stands to reason that if the patient has a foreign body, 
uh, within the bronchus, the minimum IP images would be able to show this so well. So again, we've uh, done a volume minimum IP, let's say of about 15 to 20 millimeters. The computer takes the blackest structure, make it even, makes it even blacker, and then we're able to see the, the pathology that much well. When we look at tuberculosis, and we also know now from the literature that TB can involve the main bronchi as well. And again, when we have irregular wall thickening of the main bronchus, as we see here, extending into the upper lobe bronchus, the extent of bronchial disease, the cystic change that we see here, the ectasia, the alternating stenosis and dilatation that you have throughout the lower lobe bronchus and the intermediate bronchus is just so beautifully appreciated on these minimum IP images. Another patient here who has diffuse wall thickening of the main bronchus and the upper lobe bronchus and then again the minimum IP image shows that very well. So in the last about um, 30, 30 odd minutes we've looked at bronchiectasis one of the simplest diagnoses that we can make in chest radiology. And we looked at how to make a diagnosis. We've looked at the, uh, how to pick up the etiology uh, to stage the disease. And then we looked at constrictive bronchiolitis as a component of bronchiectasis or perhaps occurring on its own. Following that, we looked at the proliferative or the white bronchiolitis, and it's typically some form of infection as with TB or some form of diffuse inflammation. Thank you for your attention.